Welcome to the October 29th WIP Town Hall, co-hosted by the City of Carlsbad and being broadcast live by Red Rocket over live stream. We're very pleased to welcome the new director of the Carlsbad Field Office, Todd Schrader, who will be one of our presenters tonight, along with Nuclear Waste Partnerships, Jim Blankenhorn. We'd also like to welcome our other special guests tonight, including Bernadette Granger with Congressman Pierce's office, Beverly Allen with Senator Tom Udall's office, Diane Ventura with Senator Martin Heinrich's office as well. We also have Councilman Lisa Anaya Flores over here, and also Chrissy Carrasco with NMAD. Mr. Schrader's past experience includes being the director of the headquarters office responsible for supporting Hanford's Office of River Protection, where he led DOE efforts and included a plan for tank retrievals and completion of the waste treatment plant. He was previously a project manager for the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management, leading key components of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing process for the Yucca Mountain Project and held various positions at the Hanford site, including serving as the Hanford site, Hanford site Transuranic Waste Program Manager and as Facility Area Engineer for the waste treatment plant. He also served as a Facility Area Engineer for the waste treatment plant and gained valuable experience overseeing the construction of this large radiological chemical processing facility. While we are on the subject of introduction, we also very much enjoyed the chance to speak to Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, Deputy Manager for the Department of Energy this week during a very short visit she took to tour the waste isolation pilot plant. Dr. Sherwood Randall made a great impression during her visit to Carlsbad. John Heaton is serving as our moderator tonight. I'd also like to announce that we have decided to move our town halls to quarterly though we can certainly always add a special town hall if the situation depends on it. We appreciate the opportunity to be updated on WIP recovery and encourage WIP to continue to implement additional ways to bringing its recovery message to the public. With that, I'll go ahead and let Mr. Schrader introduce himself. Thank you, Mayor Jamway. Um, Pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, this is my uh, first town hall. My understanding is this is the 36th overall um, since you've been having them. Uh, look forward to more in the future. Uh, again, uh, the mayor uh, mentioned I recently arrived from headquarters from Washington, D.C. In fact, uh, still actually living in a hotel, but uh, trying to fix that problem now with getting my furniture here and everything. Um, tonight, what we want to talk about is, is just a couple items I'll talk about and then let's see operating this correctly talk first um, recently we we uh, distributed to a number of stakeholders a number of leaders uh, environmental assessment uh, I'm sorry uh, the uh, enterprise assessment report uh, that was performed at the WIP site over the last year ending in May of this year uh, they looked at various aspects of, of uh, safety culture there and, and they had a number of recommendations we think between ourselves and particularly NWP and the work that they've done, the site contractor. We've made a lot of improvements in this area. We continue to make improvements and, and it's an area of emphasis for us and, and the contractor moving forward. Uh, the Office of Enterprise Assessment will be doing other reviews. In fact, uh, we'll be distributing another one to our staff that we just got on mine safety uh, yesterday or today, I think it was. And, and we expect more coming. They're a uh, organization at headquarters that uh, performs a very valuable function of, of independent reviews and gives us a chance to, to uh, get independent looks at what we're doing uh, throughout the facilities. The uh, other issue I know are, that has come up before and a subject everyone's interested in is the new baseline, the performance measurement baseline. Uh, we anticipate getting this from, receiving this from the uh, NWP around mid-November, sometime about that. We'll take a little bit of time to review it, understand what's in it, uh, and at some point we will uh, come back and discuss it a little bit further uh, with everyone. And, and that will have uh, what I think everyone's interested in, some firmer dates about when the when startup's gonna occur. Uh, we, 
as the Secretary said, it's going to be within 2016, we believe, based on everything we're doing, and uh, we're working hard to maintain that schedule. Um, sorry. A few pictures. Uh, I don't think we've, this has come up before, but within our building, we have a new emergency operations center. It's been completed. We're having training for everyone on it right now within our organization. The, uh, we're planning sometime in November, uh, trying to finalize the date now of having an open house where people can come and look at it and understand what's going on. The center will be used for both on-site uh, events as needed and also it'll support uh, any incidents involving our transportation across the country as uh, we resume uh, true pack shipments. The last thing I'll bring up, um, as the mayor said uh, a couple days ago, our deputy secretary was here, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall. Uh, this was a, uh, a very a great visit for us. She has not actually visited a lot of our EM sites, but, but a fair amount. Uh, she was looking forward to it, and she uh, held an all hands with our staff, uh, combined all hands, our staff and the contractor staff. And some of the things she's emphasized is WIP is extremely important to both the department and, and particularly the environmental management mission. Uh, it, it, has a lot of support from headquarters, the sec from the secretary on down, and um, you know anything that we need, or for the most part, we can call back there and get help as we're moving the mission forward. Uh, she's definitely uh, she's behind the project, the secretary's behind the project, and her overall impression was she uh, thought very impressed with the site, understood how hard the work is for employees. We took her both underground and through the surface facilities, um, and more importantly, she was also very impressed with the support from the from the local community, uh, local congressional leaders. Um, and and uh, I think she expressed that in a morning breakfast we had with a number of people. The, uh, so saying that, that actually was sort of the big pieces I had to cover tonight. I think we'll turn it over to Jim to talk a little bit about where we are in the actual recovery uh, moving forward here. Okay, good evening. So it's been, uh, Let's see, I think the last town hall was first week in September. So we've been about two, not quite two months, uh, but a significant amount of work's been done um, in that period of time. And, and I'm gonna give you a quick update on, on uh, some of the successes that we've had and then uh, and lay out for you sort of the path forward in terms of uh, the steps we need to go through to complete, to get to uh, in placement of waste and resumption of operations. I did wanna build a little bit more on, uh, on Todd's comments on the EA reports uh, so, as he mentioned, there's been two of them, and one of them uh, has been distributed, I think, fairly widely. Um, and so it's not, not necessarily uh, new news. But if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to uh, absorb that report, it was uh, an assessment of our safety trends uh, from May 2014 to May 2015. Uh, and in that, they, they identified a number of concerns related to uh, our implementation of our safety basis documents, uh, the effectiveness of our, of our contractor assurance programs, and, uh, and schedule pressures. Um, now, those are all great comments. Uh, they're a little dated, um, and so we, uh, but we accept all those. We've, we've done a number of things. In fact, many of these issues have already been addressed. Uh, Phil, since his arrival, uh, we've really been pushing uh, uh, building upon the established values and expectations. Uh, we've implemented safety pauses and timeouts, uh, and I'll talk about the significance of that here in just a moment. We've implemented uh, human performance training across a large portion of our organization. We have the Leadership Academy that we've talked about in the past that's ongoing, and, and we've improved our event investigation and our lessons learned programs. Uh, but probably one of the, not, maybe not one of the most significant, but, but an interesting element that I just went through was the safety pauses and the timeout programs. Uh, since uh, we've implemented that program, um, we've seen a dramatic downturn in events, uh, whether it be injuries or whether it be uh, uh, procedural noncompliances um, or, or actual uh, uh, events that cause us to have to respond. Um, the team is doing a fantastic job. They've adopted this. We, we get anywhere from, from three to five uh, timeouts called a day, uh, and that's good because that, what that means is our folks are, are aware, they're engaged, they understand 
uh, the hazards, they understand the evolutions they need to perform, and when they find conditions that don't match our expectations or they find procedures that can't be followed uh, verbatim, uh, they're stopping. Or when they find uh, unsafe conditions, they're stopping. We're getting those issues addressed, and then we're going right back to work. So it's, it's really paying dividends, and the team is, uh, is doing a great job. The, the second report um, deals with mine safety, stabilization, and habitability, and that was done uh, over a period between November of 2014 and June of 2015. The interesting thing, at least from our perspective anyway, the interesting thing in that is that it starts off by, by talking about the considerable progress and improvement that's been made in those areas uh, over that period of time. It also goes on to talk about the underground operations, the procedures, uh, and the mine safety systems that have shown, in their opinion, significant enhancement over that period. Now, they did find a few things that, uh, that we need to, to look at. Uh, they, they were highlighting for us, again, the importance of reinstalling auto fire suppression systems on all our diesel-powered equipment, and that is something that uh, I'll be giving you an update on tonight. That's something we've had on our list to do and have been working aggressively to get that done. They were, there were some concerns raised about the frequency in which we were inspecting some of our self-contained self-rescuers in the underground. And so again, we, we, we had identified that earlier. Uh, we revised our round sheets to, to make sure that we've got the right period between those inspections. And then there was some question about how we were measuring uh, atmospheric conditions uh, air monitoring in the underground, specifically where we're doing bolting operations, uh, and, and our, our crews all go with, with self-measuring uh, devices and alarming devices, and we also send teams out uh, with them with handheld equipment, we're questioning the availability uh, of, of full-time coverage, uh, which is actually what we do. So, uh, again, as, as Todd mentioned, the EA is, is simply one of our uh, external oversight agencies, um, their job is to come in and, and take a critical look at us and, uh, and make sure that we're, we're in compliance and that we're keep staying safe. And so as they generate these reports, we obviously take their, their issues and their concerns very seriously. And if we haven't already set in motion corrective actions, then we, we promptly set about to do that. And so uh, we'll continue, uh, John, to keep, uh, to keep you and the team apprised as we get these reports. They, They'll be fairly routine. Uh, that's their job. We expect them to be out, you know, over the next several months doing different evaluations, and so we expect more reports to come. Uh, but uh, we look at this as a as a great tool to help us as we uh, as we start to focus on the things that we ne absolutely need to get done and get fixed uh, before we can resume operations safely. What I wanted to do now is just spend a, a moment or two. I'll take two um, and give you sort of a, a litany of things that. Uh, that have occurred since the last time we met. And I want to start with, with our mine rescue team. Um, you know, I, this, about this time last year, I got to stand up here and brag about the fact that we sent our mine rescue team off to nationals. They they took first place um, out of a out of a national uh, set of teams. Well, this this past uh, uh, late September, early October, they were once again at regionals in uh, in Missouri. There were 22 teams competing. And our team, once again, the Blue Mine Rescue Team took number one. Uh, so they are continuing to set the standard and set the bar for all, all mine rescue teams across the nation. The other item that I want to talk about, and we haven't talked about this before, this year was the first year. Uh, our fire department uh, competed in, um, in a fire department challenge. Uh, they went to regionals in early September and they qualified. Uh, first time they'd ever gone, they qualified, meaning that they were able then to then go to the international competition, a world competition. Uh, so they went to that world competition uh, just a couple, just the last week. Uh, there were 150 teams from around the world in competition. Our team finished 39th. So not bad for a first showing. 39th out of 150 on the world court. So. Uh, Great job by them, and we look forward to those guys not only uh, uh, doing an outstanding job for us and, and for our surrounding mines, because we do provide uh, reciprocal agreements and assistance to, uh, to local areas in the event that we need additional fire capacity, but uh, 
but we look forward to these guys doing even better as they uh, continue to compete. Um, so it's just it's just great to have this quality of level of uh, of expertise. As uh, as Todd mentioned, we we did stand up our new emergency operations center. You saw a couple of the pictures. Uh, we did an emergency response drill at the end of September to sort of shake out the bugs and verify that everything was working and we are planning an open house and we'll get that invitation out and I would encourage all of you, if you, uh, if you have an interest, definitely come by uh, and see what the capabilities are. Um, you know, this, as we've talked before, this, uh, this has broad uh, application, not just the WIP, it's also a facility that, uh, that could be used uh, by the city or by the county if uh, there are emergencies and we need that type of uh, facility, it's, it's available. And so uh, I would encourage all of the, the, the public and the responders to, to come out and take a look at the capabilities um, and, and what's available to us here in the city. Um, we successfully placed a new substation four in the underground uh, right in September. We've got uh, six substations in the underground and we had to replace one. We did that successfully. Uh, tomorrow we're going to graduate our seventh cadre from our leadership academy. And just to remind you, that's a, a four-week academy that we send these folks off to. So this graduating class tomorrow represents uh, just over 100 people that we've run through that academy. And we're really starting to see uh, both the benefit and the dividends coming back from this as, our, as we empower our, our first-line supervisors and our management team to embrace not only our values and our behaviors and expectations, but then are giving them a series of leadership tools, communications tools uh, that they are then taking back and using uh, to help improve uh, relationships and efficiencies throughout our workforce. So we're very excited about that Leadership Academy, and I want to thank the New Mexico State for, for helping us uh, to do that. Um, we've had a readiness workshop uh, late September. We brought in all of the stakeholders from the Department of Energy, some of our oversight agencies, including DNFSB and EA. Um, and we sat down with them and our NWP and, our, and all our respective contractors. Um, and we, we worked for two days to get alignment on expectations on what, what kind of readiness activities we need to go through and how we'll do that. And so uh, it was a great meeting. And it's going to help us significantly as we get ready and then as we, get, as we go through our operational readiness reviews in 2016. Um, as of the end of this month, we'll have our seven new electric carts, fire and rescue carts in the underground. Uh, we had one diesel piece of equipment prior to the events, so now we've gone to a fleet of seven electrical carts uh, that will be spaced throughout the underground and give us much more coverage and much more response. Uh, we've started the automatic fire suppression conversion. As I mentioned, uh, that's one of the items that, uh, that EA had reminded us we needed to continue to do. We've identified 13 vehicles that uh, we need to use for waste and placement or for mining operations or for ground control evolutions that, uh, that currently don't have automatic fire suppression systems. And so we've started that. Uh, we've got the first one done and the second one is underway this week. Okay, that was all the accomplishments, or at least some of them. Now let me give you a little bit more. Uh, in terms of our, of our recovery progress, we've talked about these a number of times on different slides. We've just uh, taken a different, slightly different approach now to put it all on one slide and we can status it for you. Uh, when it comes to ground control, uh, in terms of the area in the underground, and I'll, sh I'll put up the map that you're used to seeing here shortly, but in terms of uh, how we're doing in recovering the area of the underground, we're about 85% complete. We've got a little over 4,900 bolts installed. Uh, we have put the hybrid bolter into service. It's currently in the clean area, uh, and we'll be moving into the contaminated area uh, next month, in the month of November. Um, the second hybrid bolter, uh, is on order and is due in in November. So um, we wanted to have two to help us uh, with the capacity. That, remember that we bolt under electricity and not under diesel power, which, which helps us significantly with ventilation. In terms of our radiological risk reduction, we've downposted 65% of the areas. <clears throat> uh, and I'll show you the map uh, and I'll show you how the status we're making on uh, both the Yellow Brick Road and uh, downposting some of those areas. 
In terms of our electrical restoration, remember we had a little over 650 components in the underground that we needed to take out of service, uh, de-energize, take out of service, uh, inspect, clean, and then put back into service. Uh, and we've currently are just now, the last 2% represents the remaining substation, which is down in the south end of the mine. And the only reason we haven't got to that yet is because we've got some bolting to do around that area to gain access. Uh, and as soon as we complete that, we'll, we'll finish that final piece of equipment. In terms of zone recovery, we're 100% complete. And just to remind you, this is the uh, habitability recovery that we had to do and the surveys we had to do. It's the housekeeping. It's the restoration of all the safety systems. Uh, and it was the, the installation of the new floor um, that gave us access to panel seven. In terms of our corrective actions coming out of the Accident Investigation Board and our safety management programs, we had a little over a thousand corrective actions. We're about 70% complete and we're on target to have all of the pre-start items done by the end of the calendar year. Finally, the DSA revision, which is on our critical path. <coughs> this is our documented safety analysis and we'll have a, a technical safety requirements that will come with it. That's about 70% complete. Uh, as of today or as of this week, all of the chapters of that document are complete. All the chapters uh, have been reviewed and are what we, what we view at this point in time as high quality drafts. And so we're going through another review period uh, and we'll go through comment resolution and then we'll go into final production. And so we're looking to have this delivered to the Department of Energy in December. In terms of uh, ventilation status, uh, just to give you a, a quick update there, uh, the underground ventilation system, we went through a significant number of activities uh, in the last quarter of last fiscal year, June, July, August, September, uh, where we were working on the reliability of the systems. We replaced a number of the dampers on the 860 series fans. We replaced actuators. We worked on the control systems and uh, pleased to report that uh, uh, that as of today, all three of those systems are now operational. Uh, if you'll remember from previous briefings, we've talked about one or more of those fans being, being down for various reasons. Uh, we have required to run one at all times and the other two are backups, uh, but we'd like to have all three of them uh, available to us and that's currently where we exist today. Currently our underground ventilation system gives us 60,000 uh, cubic feet per minute through the underground. When you, Interim ventilation system, the status there, here's a new picture. Um, since we last met, the fan and filter units that we've talked a lot about are the two, uh, two boxes there on the, on the right of that picture. These two here. These are the, uh, the HEPA banks. And then just on the other side, you can see uh, the outline of the fans. Uh, so they're combined fan and filter units. They will give us an additional 54,000 cubic feet per minute. The building right next to it is the power distribution center. And then you can see the concrete footers in and around uh, all those structures. Uh, the, the vendor is, is mobilized on site and he's providing the supports and, and we'll be starting the installation of the duct work that will tie these systems into our existing ventilation system. Uh, this is what's necessary for us to get adequate air capacity for waste and placement. And so uh, we're looking forward to having this up and running uh, within the first quarter of, uh, of calendar year 16. Um, supplemental ventilation system at the bottom, which is necessary for mining operations, is uh, we've completed the installation. This is, this is it installed in the underground. Uh, we need to complete the power tie-ins and then we'll run it through its functional test and we'll look for its startup to meet the mining demands that we have. Uh, it will provide about 60,000 additional uh, cubic feet per minute, uh, and it will be on a clean circuit, as we've talked about before. It will be unfiltered, it will be on its isolated circuit, and it will exhaust through our salt shaft. And then our permanent ventilation system uh, is continuing to move uh, very well through the system. Um, I know it's, it's a little frustrating, perhaps, sometimes on the CD process, but, but it is making good progress in terms of uh, we're anticipating approval of CD1 here in the next couple of weeks, and then we can move on with CD2. So that's continuing to move along, and we'll look forward to keeping you apprised of that status. 
So this is the contamination mitigation map that we've used a number of times in the past. Significant changes uh, in the last month or so as we've completed the route, uh, the new road that we laid down. We put down uh, new bratis cloth and then we put uh, new salt down on top of it and we created a new floor from what used to be our transition point at South 1950 down to the entrance of panel seven and that's the green area depicted on the map. This used to be our transition area. Uh, everything to the, to the uh, south was contaminated. We've cleaned that, laid down a new floor and have access all the way down to panel, the entrance of panel seven. As part of that effort, we've also been doing extensive surveys and you can see some of these yellow areas. Those areas are still contamination areas, but we've down posted them. They're no longer airborne uh, radiation areas. And so again, that, uh, that gives our workers in those areas the ability to, to work in those areas without respiratory protection. Still have to wear their, their uh, protective clothing, but they don't have to wear respiratory protection. And we're continuing to make progress on, on uh, decon efforts and fixing efforts. We still have some work we want to do in panel seven. We want to downpost that. Uh, once we get it, all the equipment moved, we want to downpost that to a CA from an HCA, which is high, high contamination area today. Uh, and then we're still looking at uh, the remainder of the southern portion of the mine in terms of what we can do there to perhaps uh, uh, decon it enough to, to get, come out of an airborne radiation area and just have it listed as a contamination area. In terms of ground control, a little bit more green on the map since the last time we talked. Uh, the guys are continuing to work. Our efforts are to stabilize the four main north-south drifts. Uh, so the, the East 300 drift, the East 140 drift, the West 30, and the West 130. We want to stabilize all four of those to the extent we can. Uh, and then you can see we're also having to do the lateral East-West drifts. Uh, so right now they're down working around the uh, that last substation that I talked about, which is right here in this in this area right here. So they're working in this area to finish up and get the whole thing recovered in that area so we can get to that and then they're gonna to continue to recover these north-south drifts. So making good progress and when we get the, the hybrid bolter in the contamination area, we'll put it in panel seven and that's likely where it'll stay for, for a period of time. Quite a bit of bolting there to do uh, to configure that for, for waste emplacement. Okay, looking ahead, uh, this is, uh, these are the major components of the things we have to do. Uh, this year, the remainder of this calendar year, as I mentioned, we're going to be finishing up uh, the corrective actions. We're going to be uh, revising many of our procedures that we need for waste operations, and we're going to be running most of the training and qualification programs uh, to make sure that our operators and our staffs are fully qualified. We're gonna finish uh, the zone seven underground decon remediation. That's the area around panel seven and the area leading up to panel seven that I just showed you with the green and yellow areas. We've got a little bit more work to do there. We wanna finish that up this calendar year. I mentioned the DSA that's uh, scheduled right now to deliver to, uh, to DOE in the December timeframe. And then we have to move on to the interim ventilation project. I just showed you the progress we were making in terms of the components. Uh, we're looking at startup and readiness activities in the first quarter of, of uh, next year of FY16. Supplemental ventilation system then will come online to support the mining operations. Uh, we've got about eight weeks scheduled for cold runs, cold operations. And what that is, uh, think of that as uh, it's quiet time for our, for our workforce. So there's an awful lot of change going on right now. Uh, during this period of time, we stop making changes. Everything is supposed to be done prior to that. And we simply give the work crews, these are the final documents. Now go take eight weeks and run these evolutions routinely until they get proficient. And we'll also have a number of assessments going on uh, during this period to coach, mentor uh, them. But the, the intent is to minimize change. This is the configuration and the conditions we'll be in for our readiness reviews and we want to get our crews ready. So it's about eight weeks. Coming out of that, we'll do a management self-assessment, which will look at all our entire program. 
Uh, that'll be about 20 external folks that come in and do that assessment. And that will enable uh, Phil and I to make a determination on whether or not we are ready as an organization to then conduct our operational readiness review. We'll conduct a, a contractor operational readiness review, which will be about 15 to 18 external uh, individuals that will come in and look at all of our safety management programs, all of our procedures, all of our waste operation evolutions. Uh, expect that they'll have uh, deficiencies, and so we'll have a period of time after their two-week readiness review, we'll have a period of time to address any corrective actions. And then the Department of Energy will bring in a team, probably about, about 20, about the same size. They'll, again, take two weeks. They'll do a very similar overall assessment of all the programs, all the evolutions. Again, they may have, we expect them to have some, some uh, items that we'll need to correct. We'll have a period where we'll go through and correct all those deficiencies. Once we've corrected all those, then uh, Phil will sign out uh, a letter uh, declaring our readiness to resume operations. We'll transmit that to DOE. Uh, they'll do their final reviews and issue the authorization to proceed. So that's the, uh, that's the looking ahead schedule. And as uh, Todd mentioned, we're currently working the performance management baseline, which lays out all the details of this, puts it into a schedule, lays out the durations and the interconnections and, and, uh, and the cost and resources to do that. And we're currently working that, working through comments on that um, and looking to get that back to uh, the department uh, in November. So with that, I think John will stop and open it up to any questions that folks might have. That's it. Thank you very much for those presentations. Uh, I think we're, it, it's very exciting to me to see the progress that's been made and where we're going and see the end of the rainbow here in short order. Let me first say that uh, I want to welcome uh, Todd. He's come. I, I haven't talked to anybody anywhere that hasn't just uh, been faces about his, his quality and his qualifications and I think we're very lucky to get him here the expectations are very high for you <laughs> so uh, don't don't uh, let the pressure uh, bother you but but really uh, we I, I haven't talked to anybody anywhere that just uh, had you had numerous compliments to make about you so uh, welcome we're, we're very pleased and uh, added to the team and so let, let me also introduce Bill Taylor, uh, who has come on board as part of the communications personnel for DOE. He's working with, with Tim at this time. So I wanted to introduce him and uh, make sure that uh, you recognize him as a now a familiar face. So uh, I, I want to also say uh, I, I think that all of us in town are beginning to recognize the change in attitude that's occurring at the site and it's pretty exciting i think that when you give employees uh, responsibility and you treat them like adults and that they they have a responsibility to do their job and to uh, do everything and and have the ability to complain or, or, or give suggestions and that those suggestions are heard, I think it makes a huge difference in people's attitude about their work wherever they are when they're given that, that kind of latitude. And I, I want to, I, I think that uh, that that process has been tremendous. Phil, uh, I think you're to be complimented for the progress that's been made in that regard. And uh, at least that's from my my perspective, but I think that it's uh, going on site wide. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, let us get into some questions. As usual, we'll start with questions uh, in house, and then we'll go to those folks that are online. And again, I want to thank everybody for being here. That's here, and for all of you that are online. And so we'll look forward to your questions. So. Uh, Norbert, are you going to be the, the first? My first contribution is not so much a question as maybe a point of order. 
Three days ago, I received an email signed by Karl Marx Steiner that, among other things, said that uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the town hall. I'm glad to see that we didn't wait till the end of the town hall, but that the presentations were about half, and maybe the uh, question and answers will be the other half. So I was a bit surprised at that sort of verbiage. But then it said, continued, in order to be fair to everyone participating, please prioritize the top few questions you have before asking. We will also give priority to questions that are new and deal with with recovery or other issues current to efforts at the waste isolation pilot plant. That sounded to me a little bit like a vague attempt at prior censorship of questions, and I found it actually slightly insulting. So I was curious. I don't believe that Kyle sent out that email on his own. I was wondering who actually sent this out and who approved this. That was completely I, uh, don't would, don't uh, be curious. Get on with your question. Protest that, <laughs> against that. Okay. Let's get on with the question. I think it was just an attempt to well, keep, the, keep the repetition of the same questions that have been going on, meeting after meeting, and perhaps uh, move the move to new questions where people had them. Uh, questions get frequently repeated because they don't get answers. That's why. Uh -huh. So let me just uh, ask my first question then. Um, posted all over the site at WIT is this uh, sheet that says core values and expectations. In point three, under accountability, it says admit and own your own mistakes and take responsibility for your actions. Hold yourself and others accountable. As far as I can tell, there have been two major screw-ups at WIP since the two incidents. I'm not counting those. And the first was to ship waste from Los Alamos to WCS, which is a major headache now. And the second one was to develop a schedule without any contingency, which had to be thrown overboard. And right now, WIP is actually planning a second schedule. So in the spirit of those core values and expectations that are preached from the top down to everyone at WIP, my question is, who was the person actually ultimately responsible for making the decision to ship that waste from Los Alamos to WCS before we even knew what the cause of the radiological incident was? And also, who was the final authority actually signing off on a schedule under so-called project management standards that did not contain any contingency. Yeah, Norbert, you're, you're going back quite a ways in time. Um, the, the decisions to ship waste um, were, were made by a collective team of folks, including NWP, CBFO, Los Alamos, Lasso, and WCS. Uh, if you'll remember, at the time uh, of the events, the assumption was that we'd had some kind of collapse in the mine, not that we actually had had an issue with the waste. And so uh, the decision was made that we would continue to ship waste to WCS for temporary storage until we recovered from the events at, at WIP. Now, as we got into the investigations, as you know, in April and May, we quickly realized that it wasn't a collapse. It was, in fact, an issue with a container. And as soon as that decision, or as soon as that information was available, the decision was made to immediately stop shipments coming from, from LANL to, to WCS. In regards to the second question, uh, again, I would just remind you of, of the, the spirit of uh, cooperativeness and partnership that existed after the secretary visited the site in August. He very rightfully so uh, said that he had a goal and he asked us, was there a way to meet that goal safely and compliantly? And we said, there is, but it, it takes a lot of assumptions and there are a number of risks that we won't be able to account for in terms of being able to mitigate them We'll have to make assumptions, and, and if those risks come to bear, then we'll have to adjust the schedule. So he asked for, and we gave him, and it's NWP, gave to the Department of Energy, here's a schedule that if things go the way we think they 
can go. So it was an art of the possible kind of a schedule. This is a, this is a way to get there. Now, since we produced that schedule, as you know, we found a number of different things that, uh, that went against some of those assumptions that we had made, new information, additional scope that we had to perform. And so we went back and we told the department, we need to revise this schedule to account for all these things. And Department of Energy's response to us was, we understand, but now when we build it, we're not going to give you a goal. Tell us what it's going to be and to the best that you can account for all of the risk and contingency. And so that's, that's what's been done. So uh, I'm not sure there's, there's a whole lot of value in, in, uh, in pointing the, the finger back and trying to fix blame. Um, you know, I, and I know you can come up with all kinds of, of uh, sayings, but, but it truly was based on good intentions and folks doing everything that they could based on the information they had um, to put together a, a schedule. And, and that now has to be revised. Um, this schedule won't have near the risk in it uh, that, the, that the first one had. The diesel equipment that you need to have fire suppression for, yeah. are any of these that don't have it, are they in use? Or are we just not using them? Good question. Some of them we are using, but what we've done um, is we, uh, I want to say it was last May, we we identified some equipment that we had to continue to use to recover the mine, and it didn't have auto fire suppression on it. And so what we did was we, we said, okay, what else can we do to mitigate that, the fact that it doesn't have automatic fire suppression? And so we developed and gave to the Department of Energy uh, a compensatory measure plan. And what it has in it was a number of steps. And I don't know if you'll remember, we talked about some of these steps early on, but what we do is for a piece of equipment that does not have automatic fire suppression system on it today, first, it requires that uh, a pre-operational check gets done on that piece of equipment. As every time it gets used, it, someone has to inspect it first. They're inspecting it for maintenance issues and they're inspecting it for any leaks, hydraulic, fuel, uh, oil, any leaks. Once they're done with their inspection, a fire protection engineer comes out and evaluates any identified leaks and makes a determination on whether that leak is significant enough to require it to be taken out of service and repaired or whether it can be operated with that level of leak. And so what I mean by that is if it's, if you looked under your car and you just got a, a little bit of an oil drop that hasn't spilled onto the ground but it's on your transmission, you'd probably continue to drive that. If you went out and you found it dripping onto the ground and you had a puddle underneath it, you'd probably want to go get that fixed before you operated it too much. We use the same concept. So there's a graded approach used by the fire protection engineer. Then we go out and we, we require the piece of equipment to be cleaned. All right, so now that's not every time, but the equipment has to be cleaned prior to the first use and then maintained after that. And the fire protection engineer is evaluating the cleanliness. So we're looking, if you remember, the AIB report talked about accumulation of combustible materials like hydraulic fluid. So we, we now inspect for that. And if it accumulates, we're cleaning it before we put it into use. Then we operate the piece of equipment and we, we ensure that it's got all of the manual fire suppression systems that are operational and that they've been inspected and that they're, they're up to standard. And then we follow that piece of equipment with a fire crew who follows along behind it in a vehicle with fire extinguishers and other material. And so that, and then we have roving fire watches that, that aren't with that assigned piece of equipment, but they, they do circuits throughout all of the underground looking at all of the equipment that happens to be in service. So we have a set of controls that we put in place to allow us to operate that piece of equipment with its manual fire suppression systems. But as I mentioned, we now have the vendor on site and he's gotten, he's gotten the first one complete. He's working on the second and there's a total of 13 that we want to have available to us uh, when we resume operation. So 
until we get those auto fire suppression cells, we'll continue with all those compensatory measures that I talked about on those specific pieces of equipment. How many, how many have the uh, suppression? Well, remember we've got uh, we've got a little over 60 pieces of equipment in the underground. Some of it supports waste handling, and some of it supports mining. 100% of the equipment that does waste handling has auto fire suppression systems on it already. Had it on prior to the events. The mining equipment does not have auto fire suppressions. They're all manual. And so there's 13 of those pieces of equipment. That was the fire. That was the fire. The and that's the, the one equipment. that caused the fire. That's exactly right. So all, all mining equipment that we are putting into service will have auto fire suppression systems installed here over the next two or three months. But until then, if we have to operate it, we've got these compensatory measures that we're implementing. I take your previous answer, to, or your answer to my previous question as the, at least the appearance that there's one standard for the common folks out at WIP and another one for the higher ups that makes the final decisions. And let me uh, bring in one other historical interesting data point in that, from that perspective. Uh, about 2000, oh, maybe seven, 2008, uh, we had an incident underground at WIP, which was widely reported at the time, where a drum was underground, was in place that was not supposed to be there. The state environment department at the time, which was different personnel than what we have today, thanks God, uh, actually demanded that that drum be retrieved, despite WIP actually stating its case very forcefully and very convincingly that retrieving that drum would be more risky than actually leaving it in place. So finally, the DOE kowtowed to the New Mexico Environment Department at the time and retrieved the drum, despite their conviction that it was less safe to retrieve it than to leave it in place. When the Los Alamos shipments were diverted to uh, WCS, that was because the DOE had made a commitment to Los Alamos to actually, or to the state of New Mexico, to uh, ship certain amounts of waste by certain dates. So what both of those incidents, uh, I think, clearly demonstrate that safety was not number one, but actually compliance with commitments and compliance with regulations was number one, and that trumped the rest. And during the early days of these town hall meetings, since these two incidents, we have heard this mantra all over again, safety is number one, safety is number one, safety is number one. We now know for a fact that that was not so. So now the, 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 the real issue is, why should we now believe that safety is number one? I have not really seen the evidence of that. We have a train of decisions where compliance with regulations and with commitments was priority number one. Well, we heard pious pronouncements here every time that safety is number one. We have seen no evidence so far of that. With my, and now with my question, um, at the uh, ECA meeting, I think at the end of last month, there were a couple of presentations, one I believe by you, by you Mr. Blankenhorn, and one by um, Frank Marcinowski from DOE headquarters. I think in your presentations there was uh, one slide, lessons learned, and one item on there said nuclear versus mining culture. And it doesn't really explain what you meant with that. So I have occasionally a softball question. Could you please elaborate on what you meant with nuclear versus mining culture as what you see was the conflict or the problem there and how it was resolved in your opinion? Yeah, so um, for to, to sort of set the record, um, Phil actually gave that presentation. I gave the same presentation, though, at Amelia Island the next week, so, so I can answer the question because I had the same, same comments on, on my slides. Um, if you remember back to the AIB report, as they did their investigations, what, what they discovered or what they uh, revealed was that for our waste handling operations, 
our workforce uh, was very disciplined in terms of a nuclear safety culture, meaning that uh, they were the actions that they took, the procedures that they followed, the training that they had, the, they had a safety basis document, very consistent with how we run hazard category two nuclear facilities around the DOE complex. Uh, it's a, it goes to a discipline and a, and a culture uh, and a set of values that, that are used for nuclear operations. Our mining crews worked to MSHAW standards and didn't have the same uh, documented safety analysis document. They didn't have the same procedure sets. They didn't have the same, uh, they had a similar discipline, but not to the same nuclear standards that our waste emplacement operators are working to. And what, what we've maintained is while some people have said, well, you had two different cultures uh, and you need, everybody needs to have one, what we've maintained is no, we, we, need, we need both. We need our folks to be compliant with, with mine safety requirements. We also need them to have the discipline and be, uh, have the same level of, of safety and same level of culture as our waste operators have. And similarly, our waste operators need to have the same discipline that they have for nuclear safety. They need to have that same discipline for mine safety. And so that's really what we're talking about. It's a difference between um, the hierarchy of controls and requirements that, that individuals within our organization were working to. And what we've said is they need to work to, everybody needs to work to both, but we can't have one or the other. Uh, and so that's what we've set about. Um, you know, I, I can't, uh, I'm not going to comment on, on safety prior to the events. What I would submit to you is, is Norbert, if, if, if we haven't done a good enough job in, in these town hall meetings of laying out for you how important safety is, because that's all recovery is, is about establishing a safety envelope. The entire recovery, that's all it is. And so we need to do a better job then of explaining to you the, the changes that we've made since the events. We need to do a better job of highlighting the, the accomplishments that have been made and the things that we're going to continue to work on. And, and if that means you know, bringing you out to the site or if that means giving you more information, we'll definitely be happy to do that. Uh, because I will tell you that, that uh, when we preach safety in here, um, that's exactly what we mean, and we demonstrate it every day in our performance at the site, notwithstanding anything that might have happened prior to the events. Um, all, all I can speak to is recovery and going forward. Uh, so, so I appreciate the comment. Okay. Is this working okay? Uh, just to keep everybody in the room up to date, we've had between 14 and 18 participants online throughout the evening. I uh, presently have four questions. Uh, first question, does the NWP readiness plan incorporate inspections by MSHA, NMED, and EPA? It, it does, um, but let me, let me um, clarify a little bit. Um, the, the operational readiness reviews that I talked about, the startup reviews that I talked about, are driven by Department of Energy requirements and orders. And so they're, they're, they're tailored and they are configured around the Department of Energy. Now, having said that, when you look at the broader topic of startup, we obviously have to not only satisfy the Department of Energy, but we have to satisfy all of our other stakeholders. And that includes the EPA, NMED, MSHA, DNFSB, EA, I can probably rattle off. I think we counted up 22 the other day. So, but, so the point is, we're in conversations with those agencies. We are going to be working with them to, to figure out the right way for them to either do their own assessments or to, to work within the, the, the DOE structure that we've established and perhaps be part of those teams. Uh, so we're working through those details. But, but the, an the short answer to the question is, yes, all the agencies that have a stake uh, will be part of the readiness activities that we go through that ultimately lead to the Department of Energy's decision to resume operations. Is that thought, does that sound about right? Okay. 
Uh, this is a question that might require you going back to the map, um, if that's possible. Those buildings shown in the slide in place, are they where the filtration of the ventilation system is, is in place? And yeah, so if you could go back to the map and explain where the, where the ventilation system is. I assume we're talking about the permanent ventilation system? Yeah, it's given the delay, it's going to be hard to qualify. So. All right, so uh, I'm assuming that's what the question is, but, but the interim ventilation system is directly adjacent to the underground ventilation system. The supplemental ventilation system is located, if I can advance this, is located right about here in the underground. And then, and then we had this debate not, not more than about uh, an hour and a half ago. We don't have a good picture of our permanent ventilation system because it's still going through the alternative studies and we don't know what it's going to look like. We also don't know where it's going to be, so we had a choice. Do we just put something up there that says CD1 underway or do we just put a picture of the facility up there as a placeholder for where the permanent ventilation system is going to go? So that, that map is just a picture of WIP. Um, we, don't, we don't know at this point in time exactly where that new permanent ventilation system will go until we've completed the alternatives analysis, get through CD1, and then we'll know what, the, what it will look like, and then we can determine location. So we just put that up there as a placeholder, so I apologize if we confused anybody online. I'm going to continue. Uh, until that, that decision is made about which alternative, as you remember, the CD process is one that's required for capital expenditures. And so we're undergoing this process. We went through CD0, and CD1 is putting the alternatives for permanent ventilation, uh, the suggestions for that, and then it's reviewed by a group in DC at headquarters and it is actually in their hands right now and as Jim said we're hoping in the next two or three weeks that they will come to a conclusion and then after that then they can get into design and bidding and all of the things that require the construction to take place so uh, it's a this is a very important step in going forward and it also is very important from an economic perspective in terms of what goes into the budget and what goes into this possibility for 16 budget as well as the 17 budget and how that unfolds. So all, this is a, a, a huge step and knowing that then allows us to uh, allows them to get into plans for the permanent ventilation system. Remember these two that they're doing are just interim, more or less, ventilation systems to get uh, get shipments started again and that sort of thing, get some waste put into the facility. you have another question? Yeah, you've got one from the audience. You want to do that? Then? Yeah. Mr. Blankenhorn mentioned communication and that maybe they need to be improved. Um, when these decisions were made on shipping from uh, Los Alamos to WCS, when the decision was made to put out a plan that didn't contain any contingency, I'm sure there were internal discussions and I'm sure there were people who were actually warned that these were the wrong decisions, but apparently these people were told to shut up. So none of these two decisions was made really in a publicly transparent way. And transparency was one of the key words that was promised to us by everybody from Washington DC down here to the local CBFO when those two incidents happened. We have a de deficit of transparency ever since. What we have instead is basically decisions are made and they are then announced to the public. And just one other indication of that communication has a serious deficiency. And since we now got a new communications fellow here for the CBFO, we have this publication from NWP that comes out, I think, every week or every two weeks, which has the title, Whole, The Whole Truth. This is utter hubris. There's no such thing. 
Okay? And I'm surprised that nobody inside the communications group of either CBFO or NWP has actually been able to speak up, or maybe they did speak up and they were told to shut up. That this is ridiculous, a title like that. Reminds me of the commun Communist Party organ of the Soviet Union, Pravda. That means whole truth. You're, you're in a mood tonight, Norbert. I'll give you that. Uh, you know, I don't know what you want. You ask for one thing, and then when you give it to you, you don't like it. So we'll continue to try to communicate, but we, we purposely put out a weekly letter to our employees to let them know what has happened in the last week. And we do that to improve the communications within our workforce. Nothing wrong with it. Now, as, as a, well, because everything we put in there is truthful. There's not a lie in anything that we've ever put out. Now, we share that with the public because we were asked to increase the communications that we're putting out to the city and other folks that have an interest. And so we're doing that. And we're going to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you find an error in anything that we ever put out, by all means, let us know and we'll correct it. But, but it is the whole truth um, for that week. That's the message that's coming from our president. So, uh, you know, I can't, I can't speak to anything that happened prior to the events, Norbert. All I can do is talk about going forward. So, Okay. Um, the next question is actually related to what we were talking about in a minute ago, is if you could please describe the permanent ventilation alternatives. Yeah, I think, I think the best, I mean, we've done that prior, too, so I, I would remind folks if they, if they want a lot of the detail, we, they can go back several town halls, and we talked about all the alternatives that were being considered, and they got sent up as part of the CD1 package. But, but uh, I would, for tonight, I would just say it's probably best if we table that as a topic for the next, uh, next uh, town hall, and we can bring back drawings and all the options and then explain it in detail versus trying to to just talk through it tonight without a whole lot of supporting documents. Okay. Um, so another ventilation question. If diesel engines are no longer being used, why is the need to accommodate 174,000 CFM? It seems very strong. Where is the intake for all that movement of air? So uh, again, I'll perhaps folks are, are coming in new. So remember that Prior to the events, we operated two of the three 700 series fans that drew, on average, 540,000 cubic feet per minute through the underground, 540. Uh, and that air is drawn through the air intake shaft, it was drawn through the salt shaft, and it was drawn through the waste hoist, but most of it is drawn through the air intake shaft. What we're proposing going forward is the use to the maximum extent possible, we are replacing diesel equipment with hybrid equipment. Now, hybrid means it runs electric and diesel. So part of the operation is diesel, part of the operation is, is electric. It's not all electric or all diesel. So uh, we're gonna convert as much as we can, but there are some pieces of equipment that either don't exist as electric or hybrids or are inefficient if they're electric or hybrid, and so we have to maintain them as diesels. So we'll continue to have diesel operations. Uh, the airflow that we're talking about is just the incremental changes that we need to make, as, as John pointed out, to support waste emplacement and to support mining operations while we move back to a permanent ventilation system, which will likely go back to around 500,000 or so cubic feet per minute using the existing intake shafts to provide the air. Just real, real quickly, maybe every piece of diesel equipment has a, a, a number on it that tells you how much particulate and how much airflow you have to have for that piece of equipment to run. And when you combine the numbers of people down there that have to have air contaminated and the diesel equipment, it's very limited with that 60,000 CFM very limited and so because of that uh, we have to have more ventilation to have more equipment that can operate in the mine and remember it's a confined space with airflow going through it 
and unless you have uh, ventilation, you you just can't operate equipment. That's just the way way it is. You could you can't uh, keep people safe and healthy in the mine. Okay, um, I had a bad day today. <clears throat> I was very upset before I came to this meeting. Okay. And it's because I was reading about stolen items from Lano being thrown on the side of the road and put in the back of people's pickups. And what I want to know is these things were taken out of an area, 54, TA-54, TA and I'd like to know if that's where our waste is being packaged yeah so I, I I can't speak at all about what's happening at Lanol and their and their control of their equipment um, the waste that we receive is stored at TA 54 it's not generated at TA 54 TA 54 is just a storage location the waste gets generated at, at other areas on site and then shipped to TA 54 for storage now, part of the, if, if after it comes into storage, if it requires remediation, it's shipped to a place called Wicker, which is outside of TA-54, um, and then processed there and then shipped back to TA-54 for storage. Uh, so TA-54 has very limited processing capability. It's primarily a storage facility. So, um, Mary, I don't know, but I can't, I can't speak to the to the other issues in terms of their accountability of equipment. Well, doesn't this speak to the whole operation at Lanol and our, you know, canisters up there? I mean, they're in jeopardy. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's, you know, people are handling waste that shouldn't be handling it or band saws that are, hand, you know, cutting up waste and then they're taking them home. And I don't know what's going on out there. How can a person walk out of a building, you know, with a contaminated piece of equipment without some alarm going off? Uh, Mary, just, those are those are great questions. You're just you're just asking the wrong people. Um, what what I can say though is that uh, you know as part of as part of our lessons learned from the events, uh, we we have a number of corrective actions. We being NWP, CBFO, uh, headquarters, and then Lanel itself has corrective actions. But but what I can tell you is that the corrective actions that we're putting in place to enhance the certification programs, to enhance the characterization programs, to increase the confidence that we have in what's in the container and how it was packaged and how it was handled. We're putting in place new programs that, that'll be implemented uh, before we take anybody else's waste from any site. So, so while I can't address the issues that you're referring to, what I can say is that we're putting in programs that will give us, give you, the confidence and the assurance that what, what we're receiving is in fact what we all believe or what it was reported to be. Uh, so we've got to build that and that's still that's in the process. We don't have that complete yet, but we are building those processes and building those. It systems. seems to be going backwards at Lanel. <laughs> uh, yeah. they, they, I have we really one, need to get them down here to, to, to address those questions. I have another really important concern in this report. They noted um, inadequate preparation for hot work, a subsequent small fire in the underground, and non-reporting of the fire by both the workers and their supervisor. Right. But I don't know I if you'll remember. Oh, yeah. No, no. We, we talked about that for two, two town halls. I'll remind you of it, though, and it might, it might come back to you. Uh, we had guys that were doing some welding operations on a bulkhead. They were actually cutting the bulkhead so they could take it down. Now remember, the bulkhead is fabricated with its metal, but it also has a flashing because the, you know, the underground moves, the salt moves, and so we put a flexible flashing around it to account to give it that uh, movement. Um, when they cut, were cutting through, they, they caught a corner of that flashing, and, and it caught on fire. Now, I think I described it as the cutting torch was about, had a flame on it of about three inches. The fire that they started was about the size of a candle flame. 
and the individual doing the work who was wearing all the appropriate PPE, when he saw it, reached out, squeezed it, and put it out, snuffed it. The gentleman standing right beside him had a fire extinguisher and, as a prudent measure, continued to put out the fire or put out the, just sprayed the fire extinguisher on the area. Now, all that was okay right up until the point where our operators chose to go back to work without making any notification. Because in their mind, they'd done that many, many times before. It wasn't an out of control fire. It was something that they, it wasn't even to them, really wasn't even a fire. It was smaller than the welding torch they were using. And they put it out successfully. And so we had a stand down. I don't know if you remember that. We talked about, we, we suspended all operations. We talked to everybody about you know, what our expectations were, that we had different expectations. We wanted them to stop. We wanted them to put it out. But then we wanted them to report and not go back to work until we had sufficient time to send crews in to further investigate it and make sure that it was, in fact, out. And if there were any other needed to change the process, we'd do that. So that, that's what that's referring to is that event that we talked about a couple months ago. That's okay. Well, it's not described the same way I described it, so you can't, yeah, you couldn't necessarily understand. If I may, I want to get back to that issue of accountability. Um, it sounds probably tonight here as if I was attacking Jim or as, as, as if I was attacking uh, NWP. Far from it. As a matter of fact, NWP and any management on, and, and uh, uh, operating contractor follows the incentives provided by the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy is finally responsible and they need to be accountable. And what I'm missing there is any accountability. Again, because there's no footprint of any DOE person on the decision to ship that waste from Los Alamos to WCS. My best guess is it went at least to the Klaus or Mosinowski level, possibly higher. Somebody up there was a final approval authority. But that is at variance with the core values of WIP today. So how are those WIP workers supposed to believe that this is actually serious when the original you know, uh, person that is in charge actually hasn't taken, hasn't taken charge and, and responsibility? And one compliment actually to Phil Breidenbach here. While I disagree with the title of the publication that you put out, I think it is pretentious and hubris. And hubris. I do compliment you on putting your name underneath every one of them. And that is actually a problem that we has been at WIP for the last three or four decades. And that is, you have Sandia National Lab, for example, that is, issues a lot of reports. Every one of these reports carries the name or the names of the authors. None of the reports, or hardly any of the reports, by the contractors, the MNO, as the names of anyone who actually did that report. And when I brought it up years ago, it went all the way up to DC and was, well, that's not the way we do business. You're not going to get accountability until you affix names of people who are responsible for those decisions to those decisions and those documents. So Mr. Schrader now is the new guy in charge here. So you have a chance to actually improve the accountability here at WIC and possibly also to push within the DOE system that we finally have some accountability. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, check one of those answers by Kali Fiorina in last night's debate about what accountability she had when she was in charge of HP. And maybe DOE could check with her. Maybe you need to check with the validity of what she said versus what actually happened. Okay. Phil, do you want to? I guess mine would be just uh, to try to clarify. Because, again, I don't, I don't think we can let everyone uh, think the way it's being led here. And I wasn't here at the time. And so I wasn't involved in, in, in that decision. But I have, it has been explained to me. And when, when the event happened, and Jim did answer this correctly, said it once, I want to know the um, 
When the event happened, we didn't know the cause. We thought, the most likely, and I was here for that, the most likely that the cause was a ground fault. They had drums in, Atlanta, in, in Los Alamos, and they had no reason to believe at that time that there was anything wrong with those drums. And a decision was made, and I believe it was an acceptable decision based on what I know, to ship those drums to another site. Now, when it became clear, after we had gotten back several months later, after we'd gotten back into that panel and saw that it was not a ground fault, that it was a drum, and that it was a drum from Los Alamos, those shipments were immediately stopped. So the decision to stop them was correct. And it was made when the, when the information was understood. And that's the way I understand it. Yes, I understood the explanation that the invite now I'm getting that you gave right now. And what you actually put, put a good point on it. You said that nobody saw a reason to think that it was a drum from Los Alamos. That he all meant that. Also, there was absolutely no reason to assume that it had anything to do with a roof off. And everybody at the time who knew anything about mining said this is one of the newest areas that was mined underground and this is one of the least likely explanations. Nevertheless, the nuclear safety professionals that ruled the roofs within DOE couldn't even think of Los Alamos. It was the mine that had caused it. And based on that, they made the decisions. And I think that is part of the culture that we are still ruling it with and that we need to change. And that's why I asked earlier the question about the, the, the difference between mining culture and, and nuclear safety culture. That's what need to, needs to be addressed. Those are some of the fundamental problems we have. Good point. I, I think that clearly there's a major effort in changing that culture. And that decision was made, it's history. What we need to do, Norbert, is go forward. And I think you will get the demonstration you're looking for about it. You'll, you'll get the demonstration that you're looking for in terms of accountability with all the employees, their attitude, their their new desire to, to make WIP the very best facility in the world and continue with that as they as they had, as you know, in the past. And that will reoccur. And you'll see that demonstration when they go through operational readiness. And I, that's where that demonstration will be very evident. Okay. Okay. Our, our mic is getting close to being ceased here, so if, if <laughs> you guys answer this, would you please answer loudly? I don't know if, if that fixes the mic battery down here or not, but we'll try it. Um, I have one more question come through online. Um, how, if at all, is MWP working with DOE and studying focusing on possible above ground waste storage options at WIP? Have any breakthroughs emerged? And what would be your hopeful timeline for opening the study temporary facility? So I'll just remind everyone that uh, I think I've got yeah, signal. Um, I haven't been talking as much. Uh, I'll remind everyone that the, that the general provisions of agreement that uh, the Department of Energy and NWP and, and NMED uh, have in place as a result of our ongoing uh, negotiations to the, with the compliance order, it, it had in there a, um, uh, an item from NMED saying that they would, they would consider uh, above ground storage as an option. And so we're currently evaluating the, the different, the various options associated with that. Uh, what it would take uh, to prepare designs, safety basis documents, permit modifications, uh, and what the cost and schedule would be associated with that. And we're working with the Department of Energy as we pull that information together. Uh, we're reviewing those options with the Department of Energy. So we're not in a position at this point in time to, uh, to have any uh, details in terms of timing or exact location or what it would look like or anything like that. Okay, Any, anything else? 
Again, uh, I want to thank our presenters and welcome Todd to the community. And uh, we're looking for uh, great results according to all the expectations we received. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments. And uh, those of you online, thank you. And this will be online when? It's online already. OK. Yeah, I mean, put up uh, for permanent viewing for those that are interested. And many people come back, usually two or 300 sometimes, come back and look at these after the fact. Uh, don't They're probably watching the baseball game or watching uh, the football game tonight, but uh, they'll come back and look at it at their convenience within the next week or so. So again, thank you all very much. We appreciate your attendance.